Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Hari Prasad, Associate Professor at the Department of Biophysics, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Today, I am going to talk to you about the aspect or module of clinical proteomics from the paper Techniques in Molecular Biophysics, Paper 1. The learning objectives in this particular module would be Introduction Concept of same genome but different proteome, need of clinical proteomics, clinical proteomics as a platform for research, the salient features of clinical proteomics and the rationale of clinical proteomics, important aspects of clinical proteomics, comparative gel-based proteomics and dye proteomics, validation experiments, applications and methodology of in, used in clinical proteomics, trypsin digest peptide mass fingerprinting and finally the summary. Proteomics is the profiling of all proteins expressed by an organism or a tissue at a certain point of time under certain specific conditions. Clinical proteomics is the study of protein profiles in the human body tissues in various pathophysiological conditions. Clinical proteomics to an extent overcomes the shortcomings of the static nature of genomics and the unstable nature of RNA which is a alternative splicing in transcriptomics. Clinical proteomics helps to understand and study the biology of a disease causation, the sequel of pathology, drug response and is very useful in biomarker discovery. Along with metabolomics which is the study of the, all the molecules, it becomes the basis of what you call as the personalized medicine towards which our current state of health is headed. Concept of same genome and different proteome. Let us here take an example of the life cycle of butterfly that we see in a biological system. The first stage is the eggs. Next you have the caterpillar. Third you have the chrysalis or the pupa. And the fourth stage is the beautiful colorful butterfly. Now the question to you students is what is it that is common in these four morphological types? Do you have the answer? Yes, what is common across these four types is the genome. The genomic blueprint is same across the four stages. But why does each morphology or phenotype differ so much from each other? The answer lies not in the genome but the regulation of the particular genome. When you say regulation of the genome, we then go on to understand aspects of the extent of transcription that takes place in each of the systems and the consequent steps of translation that results in the synthesis of proteins and its functions. This is a very classical example to demonstrate the fact that in many ways genome is slightly static in nature whereas transcriptomics or the proteomics that is used in understanding the expression of proteins is more dynamic in nature. Now we come to the concept of the human body. We know that we have a very varied population across the globe in different countries and continents. What is important to note is, in spite of all the variations that you see in the human body from different parts of the world, it is only 0.1% of the genome that varies from one human body to another. 
the rest of it is all the same. Now, this particular human body or the population is put in an environment where you could have a lot of allergens, a variety of food products, a number of medicines and drug molecules, exposure to lot of pathogens and microbes, the population breathes different types of air in different parts of the world. It we are dictated by the place that we stay in, the type of physical activity that the bodies can take up and finally the environment to the carcinogens that are very instrumental in causation of array of cancers. The probability of this human body along with the different types of environmental exposures dictates different type of functions at a cellular level that is explained by the extent of genomic regulation or in other words the expression of proteins in different tissues. The qualitative and quantitative understanding of the protein expression in many ways helps to understand molecular events that are taking place in the human body due to a variety of environmental exposure factors. The butterfly and the human body therefore are very ideal examples to drive home the message of same genome and a different proteome. Need for clinical proteomics. As it has already been explained, the human body comprises of 46 chromosomes that is called as the genome and accounts for around 30 to 40,000 genes. This particular genome is static in nature and the information that is obtained hints at a possibility of an event occurring. Therefore, the content of the DNA or the genome, though in many ways useful and informative, fails to explain the final outcomes of function. We therefore go on to the technology called as transcriptomics, which is the study of the different messenger RNAs that are transcribed in a tissue or an organism at a particular point of time and accounts for more than 1 lakh messenger RNA. This information is more dynamic in nature and tells about the probability of a particular event occurring. And finally, you have the platform of proteomics where we talk about more than a 4 lakh proteins which gives information of the actual events that have occurred or are occurring in the cellular level. As you see, there are wide discrepancy between the number of genes, the messenger RNA and the proteins. And to continue, these proteins also have post-translational modifications and these proteins are not acting by themselves. They are interacting with other receptor, ligand, molecules and genome. Therefore, there is a increase, exponential increase in the complexity of the molecular functions and the data that is generated all by itself or put together is very important in the understanding of the human health and is the basis for what we call as the personalized medicine. Personalized medicine pertains to a very specific treatment 
for every individual in a manner of having maximum therapeutic efficacy with no side effects or toxicity. This explains the need for clinical proteomics. Clinical proteomics as a platform for translational research. We have patients who are seen by the clinicians in the hospital. This is a scenario of the bedside. We have researchers who are working in the lab to develop new molecules as therapeutics and discovering protein molecules as potential biomarkers which lies the basis for diagnostics. This is called the bench side. A clinician has a certain set of problems in patient management. The researcher by doing the right experiments can address these issues that are raised or that are there in patient management. Therefore, it is very important that the wall that exists between bedside and bench side be broken. It is only when there is networking or crosstalk between the clinicians and the researchers will there be effective production of therapeutics and diagnostics that will revolutionize the health system and provide answers for all ailments that are currently existing. This will help to increase not only the longevity but also will help in providing quality life to all individuals who reside on this planet. This addressing of a problem at a bedside by the bench side and taking answers from the bench side to patient care is what you call as translational research and therefore very aptly the two terminologies that are there in clinical proteomics aptly explains that this is an ideal platform for translational research. Salient features in clinical proteomics. Protein expression profiling in various pathophysiological conditions and we can do comparative proteomics and of various phenotypes to delineate specific protein signatures that is very specific to a particular condition. Then there is the association of protein regulation with clinical parameters of the patients. It helps in identification of biomarkers and drug targets. We can also understand patient response to pharmacotherapy or chemotherapy. Differentiating closely mimicking clinical scenarios. It provides a good platform to understand disease biology. And finally, it is a perfect interface for translational research. Rationale of clinical proteomics. Various environmental factors affect pathophysiological state of the body and at a molecular level cause differential regulation of genes that alter protein expression. Protein expression profiles can therefore be mapped and studied and the differential expression between clinical phenotypes can be quantified. Protein profile of equal amount of protein from two phenotypes is therefore compared in clinical proteomics. Differentially expressed proteins are then associated with very distinct human body states with all the other parameters being the same to the extent that is possible. Unique protein signatures then are called as potential biomarkers or drug targets. So, what are the important aspects of clinical proteomics? The most important thing to start with would be the patient selection which is to be stringent 
with specific criteria. Then you have the protein sample preparation which includes collection, processing, storage and experimental use and these have to be defined by specific guidelines and protocols. The choice of the tissue is different for different research questions and depends on the feasibility and patient compliance. And you need ways to tackle high abundant proteins and the salt before you can proceed with certain few other proteomic experiments. Discovery is done using small set of samples but the validation has to be done using antibody based assays on a large cohort that helps in statistical analysis. Of course, there are certain limitations of gel based proteomics and those have to be borne in mind either while doing the experiment or at the time of interpretation of data. The sensitivity and accuracy of mass spectrometry is another important factor in doing the right identifications and picking up the right signals. Comparative gel based clinical proteomics. As it has already been explained, protein profiles from equal amount of protein emanating from two different phenotypes are profiled and compared on a gel matrix. Differentially expressed spots are then associated to the phenotypes and helps to answer the relevant research questions. These protein profiles that are run show a number of spots on the gel. Therefore, comparing two gels and spotting the difference helps in identification of potential biomarkers and drug targets. In the very first example, we have two slides that shows the wildlife of Africa. In the first impression, the two slides A and B look to be the same, but they are not. There are subtle differences between the left and the right panel. If you people look closely, I am sure you will be able to pick out a certain number of differences. Therefore, it will mean to say that the two slides A and B are similar but not the same with subtle differences. In much the similar way, when we do protein profiling and compare two phenotypes, it could be either motile sperm cells and non-motile sperm cells. It could be the proteins that have been isolated from Crohn's intestinal tissue with the normal intestinal tissue or it could be comparison of the protein profile of a normal tissue with the tissue that has been exposed to large concentrations of copper. You will see that the panels A and B just like the example look to be the same but on close observation we can point out and see subtle differences between the two panels. These spots are the proteins that are differentially expressed between the two conditions and if identified hold the clue to discovering biomarkers and potential drug targets. DIGE stands for differential in gel expression. What is it that is done in DIGE? When you talk about the samples, you have, you could be running three sets of samples that is the diseased which represents the experiment, the healthy control that represents the normal and then you have internal standard which is a pooled collection of all the samples that is used for normalization. The proteins from these three sets are labeled with cyanine dyes and are run on a single gel to avoid gel to gel variations, enable in gel analysis 
and decrease the researcher or the experiment induced bias. What are the steps that are there in diet? You have rehydration, isoelectric focusing, equilibration and finally STS page analysis is carried out. Labeled proteins are visualized using a Typhoon Trio variable mode imager by scanning the Cyanine 2, Cyanine 3 and Cyanine 5 images in different excitation wavelengths and emission filters. These gel images are then taken to a particular software that allows relative quantification of expression, consistency of expression pattern across a certain number of biological replicates, normalization by co-detection of image pairs which are intrinsically linked to a sample to its in-gel standards. And once the spots are understood, you then make preparative gels which are run with a higher amount of protein to enable staining by certain conventional techniques such as colloidal coma C or mass spec enabled silver staining. And this visualization by naked eye helps us to pick these differentially expressed spots for trypsin digestion and mass spectrometric analysis. Differential in gel expression proteomics. In this particular technique, three different protein samples can be labeled and run on one particular gel. This comprises of the steps that include protein labeling with cyanine dyes, you could have the disease and the control and the third could be what you call as an internal standard that is used for normalization. What is the internal standard? The internal standard is the equimolar concentration of proteins representing all the samples that are run in that particular experiment. The second step includes the co-migration of proteins from different samples on replicate gels that comprises of isoelectric focusing and two-dimensional electrophoresis. Once the gels are run, the images are acquired in separate channels. The images are then taken to a certain software where you do the image analysis, where relative quantification and consistency of the fold difference is noted across the set of gels. Those spots that are differentially expressed and consistently present across biological replicates are then picked for mass spectrometric analysis and protein identification. Once the proteins are identified, antibodies based assays are done on a larger cohort of samples called as validation experiments which help to statistically validate the identified protein as a biomarker. Validation experiments. Validation experiments are population based study on large cohort to offset individual variations. The number of samples that you take in, into the study depends on the incidence of the disease, patients registered, patients screened, statistical justification and finally the logistic and ethical feasibility of the study. It comprises of antibody based assays like ELISA, western blot, immunohistochemistry, mass spectrometry based MRM analysis and one could also do a RT-PCR that would profile the messenger RNA. It helps to derive statistical parameters such as sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, which are all parameters that reflect the quality of the biomarker as a diagnostic tool. This technique helps to eliminate systemic mass measurements in LC 
MSMS based experiments due to factors like hydrophobicity, differential ionization, and mass differentiation of a leucine with isoleucine and a lysine with glutamine. And finally, it has an advantage of having a turnaround time that is fast and an antibody and a primer based experiments are usually very specific and accurate. Clinical proteomics applications. Here, I will be providing a flavor of all possible things that one could do in clinical proteomics. One, biomarkers for differentiation of intestinal tuberculosis from Crohn's disease. Two, biomarkers or drug target identification for tubercular meningitis. Three, biomarkers for differentiation of advanced ovarian cancer. Four, biomarkers for understanding chemotherapy response in advanced ovarian cancer. Five, biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. Six, biomarkers for leishmaniasis. Seven, biomarker to explain the possible mechanisms for ectopic implantation in endometriosis. Eight, biomarkers for sentinel lymph node identification in early breast cancer. 9. Biomarkers to explain rationale of co-administering stem cells with cytokines in myocardial infarction. And finally, 10. Biomarkers for monitoring pharmacotherapy in Parkinson's disease and schizophrenia. I will be taking you through, through some of these applications in the next few slides. Biomarkers in visceral leishmaniasis. Using the technique of gel-based proteomics and differential in-gel expression, six sets of biological replicate gels were run and we identified a number of proteins which were differentially expressed like C1 inhibitor, apolipoprotein A1, retinal binding protein, transthyretin and alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. When we did the western blot, we found C1 inhibitor, transthyretin and apolipoprotein A1 to be differentially expressed between the diseased samples and the healthy controls. These three proteins individually or as a panel could therefore be potential biomarkers for visceral leishmaniasis. Cerebrospinal fluid proteomics for biomarkers and targets in tubercular meningitis. Proteins were isolated from the CSF of tubercular meningitis patients and healthy controls. Differential in-gel expression experiments were conducted and we identified a panel of proteins that were differentially expressed in the two conditions. We identified albumin, alpha-1 and p chymotrypsin, glial fibrillary acidic protein, haptoglobulin, isoforms of apolipoprotein, arcridonate 5-lipoxygenase, immunoglobulin kappa C chain and haptoglobin. As you can see, the relative ratios are presented in column 4 and the statistical significance in the last column. Of these proteins, we have validated glial fibrillary acidic protein and 5-lipoxygenase which is comprehensively shown to be upregulated in tubercular meningitis CSF as compared to both control and also in fungal meningitis which is a closely mimicking condition for tubercular meningitis. We have therefore established that these two proteins are not only upregulated but are very specific for the diagnosis of this particular disease called as tubercular meningitis. Structure-based drug designing for identified drug targets. 
we have seen in the previous slide that lipooxygenase is upregulated in tubercular meningitis and could possibly be the reason for the inflammatory component associated with the disease. This clearly establishes that this particular pathway, that is the leukotriene pathway in the archidonate cycle is a causation for the pain in the disease and therefore qualifies this particular protein along with other proteins in the archidonate cycle pathway as potential biomarkers. We therefore structurally characterize the protein and developed small molecules and peptide inhibitors to inhibit this particular enzyme and therefore modulate the particular disease. We see that the small molecules very nicely occupy the space that is there at the active site of the particular enzyme and makes an array of interactions with the amino acids at that particular site. The increased number of hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions, Van der Waals interactions and the coordinate bond with the calcium helps to establish that these small molecules and the peptide shown in the lower panel are potential drug molecules that can either be used or be developed against this particular protein in inflammatory conditions. Biomarkers in Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a debilitating disease that causes dementia in the elderly group of population. When we did the experiment, that is the DIGE, we identified an array of proteins that were differentially expressed and interactomic studies and pathway analysis helped to explain the endoplasmic reticulum stress as well as the final culmination of amyloid beta aggregation which is the sign cure of Alzheimer's disease in the hippocampal region. Different points or different aspects of this interactomic pathway helps to provide potential points that can be used to target and develop molecules. This helps to understand the disease called as Alzheimer's disease better and also helps to develop the right molecules to the right drug targets. Biomarkers to monitor efficacy of pharmacological intervention. This is a scenario which helps to compare the state of the midbrain with low concentrations of dopamine, normal concentrations of dopamine and high concentrations of dopamine. The fluctuation of dopamine concentrations between the two spectra is seen when patients with Parkinson's present with schizophrenic symptoms and patients with schizophrenia present with tardive dyskinesia. We therefore have delineated certain differentially expressed proteins that help us to monitor the disease across the two spectrums in a way as to monitor the therapy and increase the efficacy in a way as to cause a useful advantage of the patient overcoming the disease with the minimum or no side effects. Effect of cytokines on cardiac stem cells Implications in regeneration of acute myocardial infarction. In this particular study, Vister rats were used to isolate cardiac stem cells. And the cardiac stem cells were grown in the absence and presence of a certain growth factor cocktail. The cardiac stem cells were validated by immunoelectrofluorescence and fax studies and 
the effect of the growth factor cocktail was evaluated using microscopy mtt assay and animal model studies all the three experiments that also included echocardiography and histopathology on the post infarct tissue clearly established the usefulness of cytokines to be administered along with the stem cells now we have shown that cytokines provide an advantage when used along with stem cells but what is it that helps the stem cells to gain this particular advantage is not explained we therefore did differential angel expression a technique used in clinical proteomics to evaluate or delineate the differentially expressed proteins between the proteins isolated from the culture plates with growth factors with cardiac stem cells grown in the absence of growth factors we found that there were certain proteins upregulated in cells grown with growth factors they were aldehyde dehydrogenase which is known to be cardioprotective guanine deaminase which is implicated in development glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase which is shown to be important in cytokine regulation and finally aldose reductase that helps to negate oxidative stress we therefore have comprehensively used proteomics to explain the possible advantages or benefits of using growth factors alongside stem cells for regeneration in acute myocardial infarction differentiation of interstitial tuberculosis from crohn's disease using non gel based proteomics tuberculosis and crohn's disease are two different diseases that affect the intestine while tuberculosis is caused by infection by tubercular bacilli crohn's is a autoimmune disease the treatment for tuberculosis is anti tubercular drugs whereas the treatment for crohn's is steroids it is therefore important to differentiate the two conditions which otherwise have very closely mimicking clinical symptoms scenarios and investigations we used non gel based proteomics wherein we labeled the crohn's disease intestinal tuberculosis normal and the internal standard with isobaric eye tract reagents and quantified the extent of protein expression on a mass spectrometry we identified a particular protein called as a trifoil factor which is upregulated almost tenfold in tubercular intestinal globulet cells as compared to crohn's disease this particular trifoil factor has anti anti inflammatory role and is decreased by tissue necrosis factor which is high in crohn's this therefore could be a potential biomarker to differentiate the closely mimicking conditions of intestinal tb and crohn's disease differentiating primary from metastatic advanced ovarian cancer the therapeutics for primary advanced ovarian cancer include cytoreduction followed by chemotherapy whereas the therapy for secondary or metastatic advanced ovarian cancer is palliative chemotherapy the prognosis for primary is good whereas the prognosis for the metastatic ovarian cancer is bad we therefore have to develop certain biomarkers that can differentiate these two closely mimicking conditions using differential proteomics we identified four proteins programmed cell death ligand 1 ligand 2 apolipoprotein a4 anti human fast antibody and apolipoprotein a1 which have functions and relevance in the clinical scenarios these proteins 
help in evasion of the host immune system and also are a reflection of the lipid load that is there in the disease. These four together or independently are therefore potential biomarkers to differentiate the two states. Advanced ovarian cancer patient response to chemotherapy. Advanced ovarian cancer is treated by depulking surgery followed by chemotherapy. While few patients respond well to chemotherapy combination of carboplatin and paclitaxel, there are few other patients who do not respond well to this particular combination of chemotherapy. We recruited certain number of patients who showed response and who did not show response to this combination of chemotherapy and having had access to the tissue we isolated proteins from these ovarian cancer tissues. Fluorescent cyanine dye based differential in gel expression analysis. The proteins isolated from the advanced ovarian cancer tissue was used for differential in gel expression as shown here in the figure. Responders and drawn responders were labeled with Psi3 and Psi5 with a dye swapping to remove the bias of dyes and the internal standard was consistently labeled with Sanin2. Differentially expressed spots. On careful examination, we see that there are certain set of proteins that are differentially expressed and consistently regulated across the three sets of replicate gels. Software analysis for spot intensity and plotting the area under the peak. The differentially expressed pods were closely analyzed and based upon the intensity which pertains to the area under that particular peak reflects the differential expression and the regulation across the three sets of biological gels are then considered to mark out the spots with a certain type of accuracy. Relative abundance and consistency of differential expression. The nine spots that were marked are here shown to be having the same extent of regulation between the responder and the non-responder. These spots are therefore marked for further processing. Trypsin digest peptide mass finger printing. The identified spots are then taken for trypsin digestion. In this particular methodology, the spots are first dehydrated using acetonitrile. In the next step, they are trypsin digested in the optimum conditions using ammonium bicarbonate in conditions of pH 8 and temperature of 37 degrees centigrade. After the trypsin digestion, the peptides that are there within the particular spot are extracted using acetonitrile. The peptides which are now in the buffer are then concentrated to lyophilize it to a powder which is then collected at the bottom of the appendix. The peptides are now in a concentration that can be taken up for mass spectrometric analysis. The lower panel now shows a picture of the mass spectrometry machine with the configuration of the nano liquid chromatography, electron spray ionization, tandem mass, quadrupole TOF. When the peptides are sequentially submitted by the elution in a C18 liquid chromatography column, data is collected for both the precursor and the fragmentation ions. This particular data is then matched with the data band 
and the software analysis is used for the protein identification. The trypsin digest is very specific and is different for different proteins. It is therefore important to understand that the specific action of trypsin here is akin to the fingerprint that is there on every person. List of differentially expressed proteins. So, the triptych digestion and the mass spectrometric analysis yielded the following information. We have the following proteins of aldose reductase, HNRNP, HSP27 and cyclophilin A that were upregulated in responders and prohibitin, beta actin, alpha enolase, beta and gamma fibrin, enyl coa hydratase, prohibitin 1 and peroxidasin 4 that are upregulated in non responders. The interactions of these proteins in the responders helps in the maintaining the apoptosis whereas in the non-responder the protein and their interactions are important for the survival of the cells. Apoptosis is a phenomena that is usually associated with chemotherapy and survival of the cells is a phenomena that is akin to the cells not being subjected to chemotherapy. Therefore, this clearly shows an alternating balance in the apoptosis and survival pathways and therefore reflects upon the response of the patient to chemotherapy. Validation Relative mRNA expression of two differentially expressed proteins HSP27 and alpha enolase were done. It is clearly seen that HSP is upregulated in responders as compared to non responders, and alpha enolase is upregulated in the non responders, which validates the discovery phase of the experiments. Caspase 3, Caspase 8, and cytochrome C are important and integral proteins of apoptosis. And the upregulation of these three proteins reflects the increased apoptotic state in the responders as compared to non-responders. So, what are the highlights of this particular study? Fibrin, enyl-CoA hydratase, peroxidin-4, prohibitin-1 and alpha-enolase were found to be upregulated in non-responsive state while cyclophilin A, aldose reductase, HNRNP and HSP27 were found to be upregulated in responsive state. Pathway analysis and transcript profiling of caspase and cytochrome C indicate a apoptotic and cell death pathways in chemosensitive patients and chemoresistant states respectively. At a translational level, these inherent proteins either individually or as a panel could therefore be potential biomarkers for chemotherapy response thereby assisting oncologies in therapeutics of advanced ovarian cancer. So students, let us now summarize what we have learnt about clinical proteomics. Clinical proteomics pertains to the study of protein expression in the human body. Delineation of specific protein signatures in different pathophysiological conditions is used to understand molecular events in disease. Applications of clinical proteomics are understanding the biology of the disease, biomarker discovery, drug target identification, knowing the drug response and differentiating closely mimicking clinical scenarios. Gel based proteomics and non-gel based proteomics are used in the methodology of clinical proteomics. Advancements in mass spectrometry with respect to sensitivity and accuracy has propelled 
the pace of work in clinical proteomics. And as we have understood rightly, there is plenty of scope of clinical proteomics to develop what you call as the personalized medicine. Thank you so much.